Then fourth one, social altruism. Social altruism describes the personal principle that others are as important or more important than oneself, and that the collective good consists of each individual's happiness. For a king to be truly altruistic, he must come to think of his subjects as his primary concern, thinking of their good before his own. He must come to think of his job as channeling the energies of the whole society toward the welfare of each individual, leaving out no one. Prior to Ashoka, kingship in India was ruled by divine right. The king was the absolute commander of the armies. He could order whole towns or provinces put to the sword if people displeased him. Ashoka turned the role of the king into that of a benevolent father. Everyone deserved equal attention, concern, and compassion. Punishment for wrongdoing should be tempered by compassion. Although I have to say that from the Greek observer in the, in the Mauryan court, Megasthenes, Ashoka was not yet able to uh, abandon capital punishment. There are Buddhist uh, recommendations to kings, prescriptions for the behavior of kings, about two, three hundred years later, where capital punishment is totally ruled out and consistently, which indicates perhaps that kings did actually manage to do that. You know, they had life imprisonment, they had rehabilitation, they had even, in the worst case, exile. But um, capital punishment was ruled out. But not in Ashoka's time, although he was articulating the principle. Their individual lives were supreme in value, as they could be used to develop toward freedom and enlightenment. Ashoka traveled around giving gifts. He commissioned his queens and ministers to do likewise. He planted trees along the roads. He built rest houses and hospices for the poor and sick. He patronized medicine and imported doctors and herbs from as far away as Greece. He provided for convicts and their families, sent out special ministers to investigate cases of judicial harshness or corruption, and repeatedly freed prisoners on special occasions. He always, when uh, the Indian kings were coronated, they would free all the prisoners, except those who were violently dangerous, you know. He would just automatically just free all the other ones. He was quite, on the other hand, he was quite autocratic in habitual disposition, because he, after all, was a conquering emperor originally. And this makes it all the more remarkable that he would adopt a principle in which others were soon to be, seen to be more important than himself. Number five, finally, his egalitarian universalism. And this is a little bit more complicated one. In a way, I used to sometimes call this democratism, because it's the fifth principle of the Buddhist politics, or politics of enlightenment, which is that all people are equal, and it's illustrated in the beginning by Buddha, by accepting people from the untouchable castes in his order, and making them equal, and if they were older within the order as mendicants, they were superior, senior to aristocrats or kings uh, or, or high priests, people from the high priest caste, which was showing that his, which basically was walking his talk of the egalitarian nature of everyone. And, uh, but, he, but there was not an attempt to implement like a formal democracy like we have outside the Sangha. But nevertheless, the fact that the Sangha, living at a higher ethical level supposedly than the ordinary uh, society, that it had such a, a democratic or egalitarian type of principle, had a definite effect in the outside society, century by century. You know? So egalitarian universalism for Ashoka is reflected in the edicts it follows, uh, in his edicts. And it follows from the previous four edicts, in that since the individual's good transcends the collective's, since the, or rather the collective's highest good is the individual, each individual's good, since the evolution of those individuals is paramount, since the collective is responsible for them, the actual delivery of those individual goods is only possible for a decentralized, adaptable executive, 
that both knows the condition of each individual and can provide the specific support required. Though the Indic caste system was far from eradicated, the egalitarianism practiced in the mendicant community seeped out into the larger culture and into Ashoka's new model of kingship. Rock Edicts 6 and 8 give some sense of his own lifestyle as more servant of his people than the dominator of his people. And I quote, In the past, state business was not transacted or reports made at all hours of the day. I have therefore made arrangements that officials may have access to me and may report on the affairs of my people at all times and in all places, when I am eating or in my inner apartments, when I am attending to the cattle, or when I am walking or engaged in religious exercises. They can interrupt him at dinner, in the bathroom, you know, wherever, you know, or in church, you know, he's saying, you know. So I now attend to the affairs of the people in all places. And when a donation or a proclamation that I have ordered verbally or an urgent matter which I have delegated to my high officials causes a debate or dispute in the council, this must be reported to me immediately at all hours and in all places. These are my orders. I am never completely satisfied with my work or my vigilance in carrying out public affairs. I consider the promotion of the people's welfare my highest duty, and its exercises is grounded in work and constant application. No task is more important to me than promoting the well-being of the people. Such work as I accomplish contributes to discharging the debt I owe to all living creatures to make them happy in this world and to help them attain heaven in the next. King Ashoka does not consider glory or renown of great value, except insofar as the people at present and in the future hear of his practice of the Dharma and themselves live in accordance with the Dharma. For this purpose, he does desire glory and fame." End quote. Though after Ashoka's time, his heirs oversaw a bit of a backlash against his social engineering and lavish support of the Enlightenment education and cultural system. He brought the Buddhist, Buddhist levels of teacher, teaching, and community into the mainstream of his empire. And this surely was a big step on the way to the unfolding of the universalism inherent in the Buddhist movement. And the Mahayana, or universal vehicle, scriptures were soon to be released within the larger society, which the Buddha had instructed his followers to hold back in secrecy until the culture was ready for the enlightening principles to expand outward from the mendicant community into the larger lay society. It's worth telling an anecdote here of, in the Ashoka story, where at the end of his life, when he was quite elderly and close to death, he had the ambition, his ministers discovered, that he had the ambition to give his entire empire to the Sangha community. He wanted to be the biggest donor that the community ever had as a good karma for himself. And so therefore the ministers locked him up because they were scared if he did that, then the crown prince who would become king would be angry with them for wasting the national treasury, and they would all be punished and so on, because they would say, you let our dad give away the whole country to a bunch of monks. So the story is that he took, uh, he made like a, a pen out of some sort of piece of a splinter of wood of his furniture in his room, and he used his own blood as ink, and he dried carefully and hid a mango skin somewhere from his meal, uh, but until, waited until it dried and scraped it, so because it's quite tough mango skin. And then he wrote, I hereby bequeath as emperor my, the entire empire to the Buddhist Sangha, to bring that to the attention of the current patriarch Upagupta, whose name was Upagupta, the head monk of the main central monastery near Patna, Pataliputra as it was called, signed Emperor Ashoka and printed with what he called his tooth seal. He had a special seal, one of his crowns on his teeth, gold crown, was made into a lion seal that if he imprinted that like a seal on any edict, it, if you didn't obey that, you were doomed. And then he threw it out the window. He waited, he lurked by his window 
and he waited until he saw some monk go by in the street or something, and he threw it out at the monk and said, take it, take it to the thing, quickly, you know. So then that monk took it to the Upagupta, the head uh, thing, but then Upagupta realized it would be dangerous to accept it. So he immediately came back to the ministers, uh, the head monk, and he's the abbot, you know, the head of the thing, and he said, you know, please tell the emperor he has now got the merit of giving the whole empire to the community, but we're ready to give it back to you for a modest sum. <laughs> So we can build a few more buildings, and we don't really want the whole thing. You know, you keep you guys need to manage it. We we are doing our own thing. So it's a really charming story, I think. So so anyway, he did try to give the entire kingdom to the community. The story indicates of Ashoka's effort to do that indicates something interesting about the cool revolution, which is that the Buddha himself was a king. And after enlightenment, he could have gone back to his throne and then ordered everybody to get educated. You know? But he thought top-down was not the way to change the society and to change the majority of individual people. He thought this should be spread amongst the people and, um, and not sort of imposed by the hierarchy. And that, now it had become so widespread that in Ashoka's case and his own conversion from the violent fighter against the universe become emperor, you know, and then the anxiety of holding on to the empire and then repenting all the slaughter that he did uh, made him very fervent in his uh, support of the Sangha. So he kind of then tried to make it the mainstream culture of the society and to give, the, which is what symbolically is meant, like that's by giving the empire to the community. Uh, but um, in a way, it showed Buddha's strategy was superior to his, to Ashoka's strategy because in fact, uh, after he did pass away Ashoka, the next generation of uh, kings, his crown prince and so forth, they kind of withdrew the level of heavy level of support, and there was kind of a backlash against the uh, against the prevalence and the widespread nature of the society, and the expense of supporting all these mendicants and these big, like the expense of supporting big universities that were beginning to develop only in seed at that time, and um, so then it, you know that wasn't that serious a backlash, but somewhat, and then things took up again with the dual sort of system where the cool revolution proceeded like that, and it remained kind of countercultural. But in a way, although there was that backlash, then the next step, which we will see in the next section, will be where then it becomes safe within the society to release the universal vehicle teachings, which had been held back so as to not try too strongly to change the lay society's ethic and to introduce the education to the lay people. Uh, but then um, the, that was then the next step beyond that. But again, that happened from the ground level, from within the Sangha community, not by the power of the kings. So that's then, then the next step, we can say. So the politics of enlightenment, although they did control the way Ashoka did it, and we see a change finally in history eventually when we get to the last period of Indian Buddhism and then Tibet, and, um, and a few other countries. But mainly the Cool Revolution operates in that way as a countercultural force within the society.